This Sunday, we find ourselves in the third part of the discourse Jesus is telling his disciples on the kingdom of heaven. In this 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is preaching, teaching through the use of parables. And so today we have the final three parables. And as we mentioned before, parables is the Greek word for Hebrew word, which means not only a comparison of two things, but also means a proverb or a riddle. And so often we can look for the twists in the story to see what Jesus is trying to unveil for us about the kingdom of heaven. And this is true for most of the parables, most. The first two parables we have today have those twists in it. The third parish, the third parable is a comparison. And so when we get to that, we'll just talk about the comparison. So the first parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. And a person comes upon it, and they bury it again, and they go and sell all that they have, and they buy that field. Now, where's the twist? Well, I don't know about you, but I have to admit that if I was walking through a field and I found a treasure, I probably wouldn't bury it again. I'd probably take it with me. And when we find a treasure, we usually sell it and buy what we really want. But that's not the kingdom of heaven. You can't steal the kingdom of heaven, okay? You just can't take it. You have to invest something. You have to buy in. And you have to realize that the kingdom of heaven is a treasure so valuable, so priceless that that nothing else that you own is important compared to the kingdom. You'd sell it all. Similar to the second parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of a fine pearl. And when he finds a pearl of great price, of great value, he goes and sells all that he has and he purchases that pearl. So what's the twist? His response is the twist. Would you sell your house, your possessions, your clothes, your food, everything you have to buy a pearl. Imagine this for a moment. You go out after Mass and you see somebody in tattered clothing. And you look at them and you say, are you okay? Is everything all right? And they look up at you and they smile and they say, yes, I have my pearl. You think they were crazy. You can't eat a pearl or drink a pearl. You can't clothe yourself with a, well, In the eyes of this world, you could. Why don't you go sell your pearl and get some food? Why don't you sell your pearl and buy some new clothes? Why don't you sell your pearl and pay the rent? This is the way the world looks at it. Jesus is teaching us about the kingdom of heaven. He's calling for a radical choice for the kingdom. Just as he preached in the parable, on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added on. God knows what you need. One thing is important. Now there are two church fathers that illumine both of these two first parables. The first one is Saint Irenaeus, the church's first systematic theologian going back to the second century and in his book Against Heresies, In the third part of the book, in the 15th paragraph, he talks about that parable. And he says, if it's the kingdom of heaven that's hidden in a field, if that's the treasure, you don't have a kingdom without a king. And so what we find in that field is, it's not just the kingdom, but we find Christ, the king. And that's worth selling everything that we have. Not only that, the field is a symbol of the world. The weeds and the wheat are growing up in the world together. And Jesus in his incarnation, in his humanity, there is hidden a treasure. Many people didn't see it when they looked at him. But the treasure is his divinity, God in our midst. And so Irenaeus takes us deeper into the mystery of that parable. 
The second church father, St. Francis de Sales, wrote a classic book on the spiritual life, not for priests or monks or nuns, but a classic work on spirituality for the laity, for normal people like you, okay? His book's called An Introduction to the Devout Life. An Introduction to the Devout Life. And in this book, in speaking about the second parable, which is, calls us to radical, radical discipleship, he realizes that a consecrated person can do that. Religious community, Franciscan, they take vows of poverty, but the Lord's not asking you to sell all that you have. You have people dependent on you. You have children. You can't sell everything. But St. Francis reminds us that we are all called to have a spirit of poverty, a spirit of a detachment to possessions. And his suggestion is twofold. First, we should impoverish ourselves by frequently giving alms to the poor. Not once in a great while, but he says frequently. We should impoverish us by giving alms. Whenever we hear alms in the scriptures, we have to realize this is different than a tithe. Scriptures assume that the first 10% belongs to God. It's not ours anyway. Over and above that, St. Francis says we should be giving alms to impoverish ourselves with a generous heart, he says. But the second part of it is even more interesting. He says when we find ourselves impoverished, and he gives a list of things, tempests, Floods, fire, drought, theft, lawsuits, he mentions. <laughs> I think that's a funny one. When we find ourselves impoverished by these things, we should respond not in anger, not putting our whole will to gain everything back, but we should submit ourselves. We should submit ourselves with courage. We should be gentle. We should let it go. This will prove to us that we have a spirit of poverty, a spirit of detachment. And so that's what's being asked of all of us, to give alms frequently. And when we suffer losses, it's not become upset. Only one thing is important, the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus gives the third parable, the last parable in this discourse. And in this third parable, we have a simple contrast. He wants this to be clear. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea. And when it's pulled up on the shore, they separate. The fishermen separate the good things and he puts it in buckets, baskets, and he throws away the bad stuff. And then he doesn't ask someone, someone doesn't ask him for an explanation. He gives the explanation. So will it be at the end of the age. The angels will separate the righteous and the wicked. And the wicked will be put in the fiery furnace where there'll be wailing and grinding of teeth, a, a, a phrase, a, a way of putting it that Jesus uses frequently. It's interesting to note that Jesus speaks more about heaven and hell than the rest of the New Testament combined. Why? 1 Timothy chapter 2. Timothy reminds us that Jesus wants all to be saved. He talks about these realities out of love for us. We need to know the mysteries. We need to know about heaven and hell and that there will be a judgment at the end of time. We need to know that the kingdom as it's breaking forth doesn't look like what we expect. It's like the ocean that's filled with the good and the bad. It's like the field that's filled with wheat and weeds. But there will be a judgment. Out of love, he's telling us this. Out of love, we need to share it. Otherwise, we put our brothers and sisters in peril, in danger. And then Jesus asks us, do you understand all these things? They answered yes. Do you understand all these things?
don't just nod your head. I want to hear you. Do you understand all these things? The scribe, he's calling you scribes right now. The scribe that's been instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who takes from his storeroom both the good, both the new, and the old. That's what he's calling us. No, it's a scribe. A scribe is someone that can write. It also means that they can read. And in Jesus' day, scribes were the ones that read the scriptures, studied the scriptures, and made copies of the scriptures to distribute to others so that others could see the word of God. He wants us to meditate on the mysteries. A couple weeks ago, we quoted the catechism, which reminded us when speaking about the different types of soil, that that we should seek to meditate on the scriptures on a frequent, a regular basis. Not once a month, not once a week, but daily. We should reflect on the scriptures. Otherwise, we put ourselves in peril of being the first three kinds of soil. The soil is like a path where the seed's taken up by the birds of the air because of our hardness of hearts. The evil one just takes it away. Or like the soil in rocks, the soil's thin. And it sprouts up right away with joy when it hears the kingdom. But when persecution and difficulty hits, they fall away. It's too hard. Or like the soil with the weeds growing, with the thorns growing up. It takes root there. But the anxieties of this world, the concerns, The things of daily life choke out the Word of God in our lives. But what God is asking us to be is to be that good soil that produces a hundred, sixty, or thirty-fold fruit for the kingdom of God. He's calling you Scripture. He wants us to be wise in understanding the kingdom, the mysteries. That's why He's. That's why we do this every week. Why we break open the Word because it's not enough to say. I know there's a treasure out there. It's in a field, hidden. It's not enough to say that. We have to buy in. We must put it first. We know that the church is getting at this because of the first reading today, which is always tied to the gospel. It comes from 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon asking the Lord. He could have asked for anything. But he asks for an understanding mind and the ability to discern between good and evil. He asked that he be wise. And so at the end of this discourse on the kingdom of heaven, let us ask the Lord to help us to be wise like Solomon, that we may proclaim the good news, the good news of the coming of the kingdom.